Thank you, uh, Milena, for this nice introduction. And I'm grateful for the uh, opportunity uh, and the honor to be part of this uh, uh, series, of webinar series by the Strategizing Activities and Practices Interest Group, um, which I also consider my home interest group or division at the Academy of Management. And um, yes, uh, let's now uh, get right to uh, the uh, start of this brief lecture, um, an introduction in open strategy as a practice. And um, before I start, uh, I, I want to uh, begin with a very brief commercial break, uh, most importantly, because a lot of what I'm going to tell here is, of course, not just based on my own uh, thoughts. Uh, it's based upon a lot of um, collaborative work. I did one together with my sister, actually, Laura Dobusch. Uh, we wrote the book chapter together in the handbook on open strategy edited by David Seidel, Georg von Kork and Richard von Witting, uh, Richard Wittigen. And uh, a lot of ideas that are also discussed in this handbook uh, played a role uh, for also this uh, presentation today. Uh, before I go to open strategy in particular, or come to open strategy in particular, I would want to start a, a little bit more uh, broadly, generally with openness as an organizing principle. What does openness mean in uh, for management, for organizations, and then uh, focus later on uh, more specifically on open strategy and open strategizing practices. So when uh, we talk about openness in organizational context, actually um, the whole debate about whether organizations need to open up, the more, at least the most recent debate on this issue, uh, has uh, its origins in the context of uh, open innovation. And one could say the uh, path creating author here was Henry Jespro uh, with his uh, Harvard Business School book, Open Innovation. And what you can already see here in the uh, subtitle of this book, The New Imperative for Creating and Profiting from Technology, uh, you can see that um, already in these early works on openness in organizational context, a, a lot of hopes and uh, also expectations were associated with opening up uh, the potentials that might be associated with more open structures um, in a, or, or more open processes, maybe even open practices in organizations. You can see here this uh, already well-known um, image by Chesbro, uh, where he in a way tries to uh, show how the traditional innovation process uh, is in a way uh, changed and opens both uh, in terms of inbound openness, letting new knowledge in, fighting, battling the not invented here syndrome, and uh, letting knowledge out that you would otherwise have kept secret to enable maybe other firms to grow the market that you are a part of and that kind of stuff. And uh, to some degree, and there are others uh, that are maybe better equipped to explain why this was the case, this notion of openness, uh, at least innovation took off. And uh, this is a, a graph depicting the number of references to open innovation um, or citing <laughs> Jesper's work uh, in uh, publications registered by the Web of Science. And you can see um, a steep growth in terms of articles referring to the term. But still this was very much um, restricted to the innovation domain. Um, only a little bit later, and still Jasper was one of those who also wanted to, in a way, uh, develop his uh, open approach further, but still very much driven from an open innovation perspective. Together with uh, Melissa Appleyard, he published a, I, a, one of the first papers that applies uh, the notion of openness also to strategy. Uh, and uh, they write in this paper that open strategy embraces the benefits of openness as a means of expanding value creation for organizations. So you can also see again here, so continuing the notion of openness as a solution to various problems uh, and as a, as, a, as a desirable goal that managers, organizations sh should strive uh, for. Um, he also expands that and uh, in this paper, actually I read it several times until I got entirely clear how they uh, define open strategy there. And, uh, I would say, and at least after my third reading, I would uh, settle on the reading that they understand as an open strategy, a, a, several types or forms of open innovation strategy. So 
in the way that Jasper and Apple had used the term open strategy here, um, they are not actually concerned with open strategy making, but rather with various forms or types of open strategies. Um, and uh, of course, from an open strategy as practice perspective, uh, strategy as practice, practice is much more concerned with how a strategy is made and much more about the openness of strategy making processes. But I will come to that a little later. So uh, what are then the benefits that um, authors such as Chesbro, but also a lot of followers or others who engaged and applied the notion of openness to organizations and not just in innovation. I will uh, in a minute show you other domains where openness uh, got uh, some hold. Um, I would say there are several, I just pick three examples of potential benefits that in the literature are commonly associated with greater openness. One is uh, that you, it's a favorable favorable expression that it might create trust uh, in certain um, stakeholder um, target groups. So here's an example of a, a company uh, which uh, even as a very young startup, Buffer, maybe some of you know it, it's uh, a tool for planning your social media presence. They um, are renowned nowadays for being extremely open. So here's a screenshot from their transparent salary calculator. So they are extremely transparent what people earn at their company, including the C-level, even what CEOs uh, earn in their company. And if you want to apply, you know in advance what your salary will be. Uh, but that's not the only thing. They are very, they, for example, also published their, um, their pitch deck uh, for that other startups usually keep secret because it's, they consider it to be very um, valuable and they only show it to potential investors. They published it on their blog. They uh, repeatedly um, invited customers to uh, weigh in on strategic product development decisions and so on. And uh, why are they doing it? They are uh, using openness here as a some form of impression management strategy to some degree probably to overcome the liability of newness that young companies face and by being more open than is commonly expected, um, they seek to, um, yeah, gain, uh, exert confidence uh, amongst certain stakeholder groups. Then even prior to open innovation, and uh, the, the, I would say the, the true origin of, of the second coming of openness, as uh, Nathaniel Kutch calls it, is to use openness as a tool. And uh, the whole open source software development debate and you know, uh, and I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard about uh, the, the saying that software eats the world. Uh, what does this mean? That nowadays all companies are using some software in some way and, um, and an increasing number of companies ha also has to rely on developing software for their products to, or, or services uh, to be um, distributed or produced. And in this context, openness of, for example, the source code is considered to be one, a, a tool to improve software development, maybe even a tool to improve uh, to, uh, the efficiency of software development processes and that kind of stuff. But that's not just true for open source. Uh, openness might also be a tool for generating ideas in open innovation. You've all uh, heard about crowdsourcing and others. So that's in a way the second benefit that many people expect from opening so up certain processes is that um, yeah they improve these processes. They are a tool to improve uh, certain processes. And then finally, uh, openness of organizations is increasingly also considered to be a value. So a value that it is a little bit uh, associated with the impression, but it's but it's more internally oriented that. Um, if you uh, you want to be open, so there's a great book uh, by uh, Catherine Turco. It's called The Conversational Firm, uh, where openness is on the one hand also used as a tool, meaning uh, to improve communication within uh, an organization, but also uh, a value that um, people um, strive to accomplish and uh, that in a, is in a way a good in and of itself. So... Um, when we see these various benefits that are promised when adopting a more open uh, strategy, it's no wonder that openness uh, is currently um, yeah, spreading like wildfire. Um, so 
there are various uh, domains where openness is also applied. For example, teachers and also university uh, scholars, they are invited to openly share um, their educational material. For example, I myself was part of a group of, uh, of, of organization scholars who joined forces and uh, um, uh, in the light of the current corona uh, pandemic, uh, we together built a course organizing in times of crisis, all our material we put on a joint blog uh, and licensed it on an open license. So all this uh, allowed us to, in a way, join forces when we were all overwhelmed with making our, um, our course program uh, digital and distance uh, education based. And at the same time, uh, we were able to share it freely and use it and adapt it to each and others needs at our uh, separate universities. That's one example. Then uh, open data also um, uh, a kind of very a domain of openness that received a lot of attention in the course of the corona pandemic uh, when we're talking about sharing research data on for example uh, corona research or corona re or, or just uh, data on for example corona statistics. Uh, but of course the, the idea of open data is much older and also kind of related to open innovation in the sense that when you share data that was held um, proprietary before, you might enable others to be innovative and, th and then in the end create an overarching and uh, general benefit for the wider public. So oftentimes, therefore, it's public institutions, public administrations that are confronted with demands for open data and uh, even more than open data, then demands uh, for open government. Uh, so not just opening up the data, but then, and this brings us closer to how openness might be practiced, uh, not just sharing data, but also allowing um, participation uh, of citizens in various um, parts of public uh, institutions, public organizations. So, um, and this is uh, just three examples. There are others. We have uh, examples such as open hardware or open collaboration more broadly. Uh, this is just to give you an idea that when I'm now going to switch and focus on open strategy, uh, then this is um, just one domain where openness as an organizing principle is applied. And I would say uh, that what, or what I want to say for open strategy is to probably a large degree transferable to other um, domains of openness, but not necessarily so. And uh, so when I'm talking about open strategy, this is just um, the idea to apply um, the, uh, this, this, uh, or what's discussed under this label is to harvest some of these benefits that, is, that are commonly associated with openness for strategy and I will add strategy making in particular. And um, as a starting point, and this is very similar to what happened in the course of uh, or what, what was at the beginning of open innovation, uh, strategy, open strategies actually defined in a more negative way. Negative not in the sense normatively negative, but uh, in the sense as, a, as the other of traditional strategy making. So for example, Whittington and uh, colleagues in the first, I would say, uh, true open strategy making paper, they also start with describing traditional strategy processes as exclusive. They mentioned that opacity is important to strategy. And then they uh, go on with arguing that open strategy challenges both these orthodoxies. Um, this is actually in line and, uh, with Jesper and Appliard who also argue that open strategy balances the tenets of traditional business strategy with the promise of open innovation. And I would argue that this negative definition of openness as not traditional, not closed, not exclusive, is actually maybe part of the appeal of uh, the openness um, concept, not just for, for researchers, but also uh, for, for practitioners. So why is this uh, for, for, for management? Um, I would argue because um, applying openness to, to your, um, or, or arguing that you are opening up your strategy making or other process and organization allows you to be as a manager, as, uh, to be selective in terms of what you reveal, as long as you first define how that the previous way of doing things was closed, was traditional, was exclusive, 
then it's up to you what of these uh, process should be revealed and you can still claim you've opened it up you're more transparent than maybe your predecessors or others in the industry but at the same time you or the manager chooses what to reveal um, the same is not just true for what kind of information you are revealing it's also true for which people uh, you want to involve in an open process, open strategy process or other. The same is true for open innovation processes. So there's also the potential for selective inclusion, at least to some degree. And um, you might even engage in what uh, Max Heimstedt calls open washing, uh, that you uh, just proclaim to be more open, but not actually uh, want to to substantially uh, allow for example participation by external actors uh, but you want just to uh, harvest the the impression of or the benefits associated with an impression of being openness however and this brings us closer to uh, a practice perspective on, on openness in strategy and beyond is uh, that even though uh, that you might find openness attractive as a manager uh, because it allows you to have a lot of leeway for selectively interpreting what openness means in your specific organizational contexts. Um, nevertheless, all of those activities might um, lead to certain problems or dilemmas or tensions. So, for example, if you start to selectively reveal uh, information, knowledge, this might just inspire escalating demands by audiences. Uh, that's what, for example, government agencies that start to engage in open data experience that, yeah, in the beginning, uh, audiences might uh, give a, a round of applause, but then soon thereafter, um, you are compared to what are you revealing, what are others revealing, and uh, then you might face additional demands or ad uh, demands for additional openness. When, with regard to inclusion, if you are very selective in your inclusion, you might run into problems of commitment uh, that people uh, who are actually interested, uh, they, they, are not, uh, they, they don't feel taken seriously or that, they, um, that you don't attract those people that you actually need. So even though you invite certain groups, uh, you might end up uh, with a uh, quite uh, with a lack of diversity in terms of participants and this might be uh, detrimental to the benefits that you expect like a brighter var variety of ideas or something like that and uh, open washing of course always bears the risk of uh, losing trust if uh, if uh, an audience or if some of these activities are um, revealed as not sincere or yeah so you know the saying you can fool uh, some people all the time and all people sometime but uh, usually you can't uh, fool all people all the time and this is definitely a risk you might run into if you are engaging in extensive open washing activities so um, these uh, tensions that might um, uh, arise when you open up also then interact or depend on what I would call the organizationality of the outside that is uh, associated with uh, opening up. So usually it's not just that as an organization you decide to open up certain processes, for example the strategy making process, and invite either uh, previously excluded uh, participants to contribute or at least to take part in terms of receiving information on it. Uh, but usually uh, the outside that you are um, opening up to is not entirely unorganized or uh, it might even be a strategic uh, task for you as an organization to uh, organize, co-organize part of this outside to be even able to get in an exchange uh, with regard to, for example, strategic issues. Um, there is, of course, a huge variety of uh, structures and types of organizationality, I would say, of the outside, of the environment of an organization. Um, but when I refer to the outside of openness, I'm explicitly referring to that part of the environment that um, an open opening up or an open uh, strategy in the sense of Jasper relates to. Uh, and for the sake of the argument here and for simplicity, I want to illustrate this with uh, the difference that, for example, two 
I would say, ideal types of organizationality of the outside uh, that play a, an important role in a lot of studies on, on openness more broadly have, which is uh, crowds and communities. So crowds, uh, on the one hand, are, are external groups of actors where the actors do not share interpersonal ties, but are mainly related to the focal organization in some form or others. So for example, these are the customers, these are the fans uh, of, an organi of, of, of an act of, a form of an organization. Communities, on the other hand, are networks of interrelated actors, where these actors that are part of a community, they may engage in interpersonal exchange and share social ties or even a common identity, um, even independent of uh, the organization that invites them to participate. So the, if, you, if you're searching for, uh, if we are talking about um, explicit examples, um, a traditional example of a community would be the open source software developer community of a certain piece of software, uh, whereas the crowd would probably be the users of uh, this software. And uh, depending on whether you are interacting or addressing a crowd or a community, different forms or different practices of openness might work differently. So to give an example from a study I did together with uh, Jakob Capella, um, one could, for example, what, what we found was uh, when looking at um, actually the cases where Wikipedia and Creative Commons to uh, non-profit organizations that heavily rely on support by both crowds and communities. And what we found that when they invited these external actors in their strategy making processes, um, different types of strategy making practices, I'm not calling all of those practices open strategy making practices, they led to different tensions depending on whether crowds or communities were involved. So for example, um, exclusive practices um, were actually working quite well with crowds. What do I mean with exclusive practices? Practices where a lot of, um, where it's very restricted what the external actors are actually allowed to do. So there are very clear rules. That's actually what most crowdsourcing tools um, require from the crowd. You have to, there's a very specific problem and a very, there's a very specific question and the crowd is allowed to tackle this in, in ways that are also to some degree, to a large degree, predetermined by a crowdsourcing tool. And um, as the more um, you move to the right and what we here describe the degrees of openness, the more you increase the degree of openness of your uh, practices, of your strategy making practices in this context, uh, the more you're running into tensions of empowerment, meaning that uh, members of this crowd might feel overburdened, might not, fe might, uh, not feel uh, competent enough to even uh, engage in these uh, types of practices such as reporting or reviewing practices. Um, whereas um, in, the, uh, in, in the case of addressing a community, uh, this leads to different tensions. So uh, here in the beginning, you, if, you, if you have a start with exclusive practices uh, and target a community, you might run into tensions of commitment so that the community uh, feels not valued enough or has demands more openness, more say in uh, in a variety in more issues that you might want to grant them, but if you increase openness uh, of you might run into tensions of escalation as Houts and others in their um, long range planning article in two thousand and seventeen called it, so that you know you give them the small finger and soon they uh, want the whole hand so um, what all this that i 've uh, talked about so far. Um, uh, relates to or refers to is uh, an understanding of openness that I would say was very strong from the beginnings in uh, related to open innovation, but were to a large degree also transferred to recent, more recent studies on openness in strategy making, uh, me, referring to uh, openness as as a program, as a, uh, or applying a programmatic uh, approach to openness. What, what do I mean with that? Um, it's um, to, con to conceptualize openness as the opposite of closure. You remember all of the de definitions, both of open innovation and open strategy, they um, were referring to it as, uh, as not that closed, as different from traditional 
uh, innovation processes of traditional strategy making processes. And um, so openness and closure here uh, represent endpoints of a continuum that runs from close to open, maybe alongside different dimensions. Uh, but overall, the idea is, uh, and that's also the, I would say, the normative um, uh, undertone or even uh, explicit uh, the no promise that is associated with openness in this context that is mentioned in the subtitle of Chesbro's book on open innovation, but that's also um, an issue in uh, early works on open strategy making is that inviting more actors, sharing more information uh, increases openness. So on the scale uh, from, from uh, in, the, in the continuum from closed to open, if you invite more actors in, you're more open. If you share more information, you're more open. And uh, the more open you are, the better. Yeah. Yet now it's clear that um, also this literature that considers that, that I would call a programmatic uh, openness literature is not blind towards uh, potential uh, pitfalls uh, that are associated with simply increasing openness in terms of inviting actors or sharing more information. Uh, and so, so a lot of uh, literature actually is um, um, concerned with what tensions arise once you're open up so and and how to deal with them so tensions such as compromising speed so if you invite more actors in it might take much longer to uh, uh, arrive at a conclusion or um, if you invite actors into strategy making processes that previously were not involved in strategy making audiences ordinary workers customers they might just think, why should I care? I uh, want to do my job or I want to consume a certain uh, uh, product or service. I don't want to, uh, to engage and invest time in making strategy um, of the organization. They might feel overburdened or with uh, pressures that are associated with this, such strategy making processes. So these tensions from a programmatic perspective, they are mainly considered as limitations or hurdles uh, for achieving greater openness, sometimes uh, that, that have to be balanced maybe, um, but that's, uh, I would say, the predominant understanding of programmatic uh, approaches uh, towards openness in general and in uh, strategy making in particular. As you uh, can guess probably by now is, uh, that's not the only perspective um, on openness uh, that's available in the literature and I will uh, come to another perspective uh, by the end of this talk. But uh, for now, let's have a second look and a more deep look at openness in strategy making. And uh, let's look at open practices that are associated in strategy making. And then I will focus in particular on inclusive uh, practices in strategy making uh, to illustrate that what are the boundaries uh, of such a programmatic uh, view on open strategy um, what they might be and how they might be addressed also in research. So uh, again, you can see what, uh, what, are the, what are practices associated or have that have been associated with uh, openness and strategy making. One of the early papers um, that really empirically uh, investigate cases where um, organizational leaders, uh, top managers invited broad strands of an organization into strategy making was a paper by actually colleagues of myself in Innsbruck, actually, but before I was there myself, uh, they um, investigated a medium-sized enterprise who invited their employees for a two-week uh, strategy uh, process and they used a crowdsourcing tool and the paper is called Democratizing Strategy, how crowdsourcing can be used for strategy dialogues. Um, so here we can see what, what has happened is also in practice uh, was that uh, a tool that was developed actually for generating and evaluating ideas in the context of open innovation had been repurposed and reapplied uh, for uh, broader, more inclusive strategy dialogues. Um, Whittington in their paper that I mentioned already, they even distinguished two dimensions of uh, open strategy making. So they argue that open forms of strategy making um, uh, can be defined as um, having more transparency inside and outside of organizations and more inclusion of different actors internally 
and externally and how is this increase in transparency and inclusion achieved so what what are the practices necessary um, and you could probably sort them from transparency to inclusion so when we talk transparency it's it means um, increasing uh, the number, uh, increasing the amount of information uh, that is shared with wider audiences. Uh, you might even ask audience to participate, to give their input on strategic ideas or even provide their own ideas, for example, in form of surveys. Um, you might really engage in a dialogue, so invite them to not just uh, drop ideas, uh, something that we know for years now in terms of suggestion boxes, but also to comment on ideas of others or to get in an uh, exchange with uh, contributors of such ideas up until involving um, external or internal actors that were previously excluded from strategy making into decision making. So, for example, if you use a crowdsourcing tools, oftentimes there's uh, the functionality to, to rate results or intermediate results or even to, to vote on some of these results. So, if we leave out uh, the, the, the left, uh, the most left uh, example of increasing informing, or the others, surveying, dialoguing, rating, uh, they really involve uh, broader strands of people in strategy making than previously, at least in, in, in many organizations. And, um, and this, of course, uh, leads to the question, uh, how inclusive is this uh, way of, um, of including people in uh, strategy making. And the interesting thing is that um, what uh, Richard Whittington and others um, call inclusion in strategy making, so the term, uh, what, what they uh, refer to with inclusion uh, is not the same as a whole strand of literature on inclusive organizing and inclusive organizations is understanding as inclusion. So there we have a quite a different um, a definition or understanding of the concept of inclusion. Uh, this is a, a famous uh, image in the realm of, um, of diversity and inclusion research. Uh, as you can see here, the focus is much more on uh, the different personality traits or preferences or different groups of actors. And uh, as you can see, the lower uh, right corner uh, of the slide, that's in a way kind of an ideal type inclusive organization where you change organizational structures so as to accommodate to different demands and different uh, preferences by a variety of actors. Um, and this is not only driven by uh, the idea that this improves performance, but also that this might lead to more equality amongst various strands of people. You can see so very different understanding of inclusion than the inclusion uh, concept used in uh, the open strategy literature, at least so far. So this leads me to the question, uh, how are openness and inclusion actually uh, connected or uh, stated a little differently, how connected are openness and inclusion uh, when we look at uh, practices of open strategy making? And uh, I, before I go to an example uh, of uh, open strategy making that I did uh, research on myself, I again want to start with a more broader um, picture and with the, with the one, one could say, first empirical phenomenon uh, of um, organizational openness that had received a lot of attention also from organization and strategy scholars, which is open source software. And if we now bring together these two perspectives, so opening up uh, the software development process allows a broader variety of actors to contribute in a software development process but leads does this also lead uh, to the open uh, to the software development process to be more inclusive in terms of which uh, the variety or diversity of participants and when we look at uh, some studies that, or a survey of 5500 open source developers on github for example what we find is that 95% um, of uh, contributors are male, 3% are female. You might now ask, yeah, but that software development, that's a male uh, profession or male dominated profession. That's of course not uh, entirely wrong. But when you compare these numbers to the um, share of female software developers in traditional professional software development companies, there, at least in the US, about 20% of all professional developers in the USA are female. So um, 
one can see that here just because open source software uh, projects in principle allow anyone to contribute doesn't mean that anyone will actually do it. Even to the contrary, you might end up with a much more skewed um, uh, community of contributors than if you, uh, when compared to traditional organizations uh, with traditional hiring processes that are less dependent on volunteers and self-selection. So maybe that's just an artifact, maybe that's just true for open source software. Uh, so let me look at another example uh, that's not so much programming related and that's the example of the Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia that I'm sure all of you are uh, familiar with. And um, there's a lot of debate on lack of diversity among Wikipedia editors. Uh, and this debate is particularly, I would say, um, driven by uh, the proclamation of Wikipedia itself, that it is the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. So that's a screenshot from the English language Wikipedia uh, website. Um, and even though anyone can edit, uh, that's not what's, what's happening. But that's not just true for Wikipedia as, a, as an encyclopedia. It's also true for Wikimedia, the organization behind uh, Wikipedia and some of its sister projects and their strategy making processes. So that's a screenshot from uh, a so-called strategy wiki of the first of actually several collaborative strategy processes that the Wikimedia Foundation organized. So the first one happened, uh, took a year from July 2009 to July 2010. So it's all about, about 10 years past, uh, talking now in 2020. In between there, has been, there have been two other uh, similar open strategy processes, but uh, some of uh, the way these strategy processes were organized changed due to the experiences with this first one. And uh, if, if, what did Wikimedia do? They argued that, um, as you can see here, uh, participants on this wiki discussed, deliberated and developed a five year strategic plan for the Wikimedia movement. It was a different kind of strategy. Of course, they consider, uh, think it paid off, but what did they actually do? They said, okay, Wikipedia and its sister projects such as Wiktionary or, um, uh, or Wikidata, they depend on volunteers to thrive. So when we are making organizational strategy, when we are developing a strategy for uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia as, a, as, a, as an organization, we need to invite those contributors, those volunteer in and invite them to take part in the strategy process. Because if we don't do that, it's, we, we, it's probably unlikely or it's, it's, it might be even harder for uh, any strategy that we come up with to be realized. So not on the one hand, we want their ideas, but also we want um, them to take part to improve the chances that any strategic decisions will be implemented uh, as it goes forward. And what Wiki did, and some of the interview partners, one told me that, uh, yeah, we are the Wikipedia, so we throw wikis at any problem. So what they did to organize uh, this uh, open strategy process, they founded a strategic planning wiki. And what I just showed you before was a screenshot of uh, the starting start page of this um, specific strategy wiki, which was set up just to organize the strategy process. But when you look then, and again, the idea was to invite anyone to take part, not just volunteers, even um, mere readers. So I would say if we apply the distinction between crowd and community to Wikipedia, one could say there's the community of Wikipedia editors, the volunteers, uh, but then there's uh, the, also the crowd of, of, of readers and donors, which are of course also very important uh, for the project of Wikipedia. And both these groups, the community and the crowd associated related to uh, Wikipedia uh, were invited to take part in this strategic planning endeavor. But in the end, um, even though there are hundreds of thousands of people who had contributed in the past and several thousand of active contributors and there are millions of people reading Wikipedia every day and even though there were banners on the Wikipedia main page inviting uh, the audience to take part in the strategy process, never more than um, a few thousand people registered in the wiki and only a tiny fraction of those really um, contributed in any meaningful way 
to this strategic plan. And then task forces were formed. And when you then look at um, the origins, where do the members of these task for forces that Wikipedia or Wikimedia here set up, where did they come from? Uh, you will see that close to 60% of all task force members were either from the US or the European Union. So not even counting Eastern Europe here. Uh, so what you can see here also um, that the, even though Wikipedia has 200 language versions and uh, is, is, uh, is widely used all across the globe, uh, for example, the, the whole Latin American uh, part of the community was only represented with two uh, members uh, in dozens of task forces. Um, so one can see here again uh, that even though the Wikipedia is very open and was inviting literally anyone on the planet with access to the internet to contribute, in the end, only a tiny fraction actually did so. And of those who did, they were hugely skewed towards uh, richer countries from the northern, northern and uh, western hemisphere. So how can we explain this? And uh, looking into the literature on diversity and inclusion might have some uh, answers uh, on uh, what to, uh, that might help to explain uh, why uh, certain forms of openness might not achieve what they were set out to do. Yeah? So even if you follow the, the program of openness, so in a way saying, I, we are open to literally anyone, um, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you achieve uh, this kind of openness. So what you might be confronted with is what um, Ahmed um, coined uh, non-performativity, of such a, a normative concept. In this case, the non-performativity of openness, what does this mean? Let me quote uh, Sarah Ahmed. She, uh, referring to uh, diversity, um, describes non-performatives as the reiterative and citational practice by which discourse does not produce the effects that it names. So what is the idea? The idea is that um, not uh, of not in spite of, but because Wikipedia and Wikimedia are so proud of their openness, are so um, are any are telling anyone all the time uh, that anyone can participate, that they are open to literally anyone. This actually um, works as a non-performative, since uh, if then this doesn't materialize, uh, it can't be the fault of an organization which already. Uh, self-describes as, you know, radically open. So, um, and rather organizations might be content uh, with uh, proclaiming openness um, and, uh, and in the end, in, in this, in to some degree even lead to less openness uh, than when they were using, for example, different language to achieve, uh, achieve such a goal. So to give another example, you might sometimes build a door uh, just to open it, but not to really open up and, uh, and improve access, but to be able that, uh, to say that, you yeah, know, this is a door, it was closed, but now we are opening it. And uh, you feel that you have accomplished something, but it's not uh, necessarily the case that it's really leads to uh, it improved inclusion, for example, of certain groups of people. So then, Still, the question, why is open for anyone, as in the case of Wikipedia, and as it was also the case in Wikimedia's strategy making process, why is this not open enough? And I would say um, this can be explained with something that I would call uh, exclusionary openness. So, and, and here we are now reaching a territory that uh, I would say traditional programmatic um, approaches to openness have difficulty to, to uh, have, a, have a difficult time to, to grasp or to capture, uh, because this means that um, it's, it, it goes even beyond that the notion of too much of a good thing uh, uh, can be bad, uh, but, but it, it's, it's a little bit down that road. So why is there maybe a lack of diversity, a lack of inclusion in spite of radical openness? Uh, if we um, talk about exclusionary openness, it might even not, not be in spite of radical openness, but because of radical openness. And actually that's what a lot of us experience, particularly uh, women that, ex that are uh, publicly visible, um, 
that we, that we experience in the, one of the most open technologies out there, the internet, is that this openness also invites a lot of exclusionary practices, um, which directly result from an unrestricted access to certain uh, forums. And the same is true for the examples that I um, mentioned today uh, that were open source software and uh, also the Wikipedia community. Um, so there's an example of Valerie Aurora. Uh, she uh, did a lot of research on, on diversity and inclusion in uh, open source software communities. And she describes the problem that if your group has nine helpful and polite members, male members she's referring to, and one is a rude, sexist, and loud member, most women are going to continue to stay away because of that one member. So what's the, uh, what, what's the learning of this, um, uh, of this quote and how does this relate to exclusionary openness? Uh, the point is, if you don't get rid of this one member, exclude the member, then implicitly or, or by way of not ex excluding that member, you are at the same time excluding maybe a much larger group of people uh, driven away by uh, certain members that drive others away. Of course, that's not only about individual character traits, but it's about um, the need to draw boundaries to achieve not any form of openness, radical openness, uh, for example, but to achieve uh, forms of openness that you want to have. So it's not so much about then, uh, it's, it's then not so much about um, the continuum of close to open, but rather it's about a relationship uh, of openness and closure and that you have to answer the question, what kind of openness is it that you want? Uh, and for example, how diverse, how inclusive should your openness be? If you don't want to be diverse, fine. So if you say, no, I want a very specific trait, uh, specific type of um, contributors, and I specifically tailor my openness to attract those, then that's fine. But for, for example, Wikipedia, um, an online encyclopedia that argue, that, that uh, strives for um, collecting the world's knowledge and providing it for free, uh, and who also claims to follow a neutral point of view, um, having uh, following a, a, a form of openness that excludes large um, groups of uh, so the society uh, is, of course, much more harder to legitimately um, argue for and actually it's not argued for uh, but uh, the problem here is that uh, the, the, the the claim that the, anyone can add it and there are no restrictions uh, and no uh, exclusionary rules in place of course there are some uh, but uh, there's a lot of debate whether they are strong enough uh, and whether you need more exclusion so to speak to increase the inclusiveness of your openness so what can we make out of this to me, I would say this means that um, you, we, for conceptually, uh, we need to move from degrees of openness to uh, paradoxes of openness and to consider the relationship between openness and closure, not as endpoints of a continuum, but rather as reciprocally constitutive of each other. So um, if we uh, recognize that uh, there is no openness without closure, that they're inextricably linked and interacting with each other. Um, this uh, is something that not just we found in this uh, specific example, but we were revisiting also uh, several of the other studies on open strategy. And actually what you will find is always certain forms of closure. So for example, uh, you open up access to a certain uh, group of people. What happens is oftentimes that additional informal uh, meetings arise uh, that in a way prepare the now much more open meeting. So that's, for example, what uh, Leopold uh, Ringel and, uh, and I think Georg Reischauer together found in a paper on uh, pirate parties, uh, which were also promising a radical form of transparency and then had to adapt uh, because they, uh, because of the backlash that some of the transparency uh, created. So when we analyze uh, this uh, paradoxical nature of openness and closure, what um, actually this requires is not just to ask how can we reduce closure to improve openness, but rather 
what are legitimate forms of closure that we need to uh, achieve the type of openness that we want. And of course, these are explicit, these are normative questions. So you can't, you can't answer um, the, uh, the question what openness you want without answering the normative uh, question uh, that is um, that this uh, entails. Um, but as soon as you are um, aware of that, that, you know, even though you, if you want to be open or more, more open, you will probably have to rely on certain forms or types of closure, then uh, you can come up with strategies. So for example, you might restrict the scope of topics, uh, which of course restricts um, openness to some degree. Uh, the, you restrict the scope of topics that, is, uh, that are allowed or that can be discussed in a certain open strategy process. But then at the same time, restricting the scope of topics might then allow you to increase the number of potential participants. Of course, it might work the other way around. So you might want to uh, reduce the number of participants that are allowed to take part, but at the same time open and widen the scope of topics that are discussed. But maybe it's hard to achieve both at the same time, or if you want to do so, you might need very sophisticated or specific, specific open strategy making tools that enable you to um, open up both these um, dim uh, open up on both these dimensions uh, and uh, to achieve a certain um, a certain legitimate form of openness that you that you want. This brings me already to my uh, final slide. Um, what, what's, uh, if we, uh, what, what's the take home message that I want to, to convey with this uh, a brief lecture on open strategy as a practice? Um, openness is an, a value load in term. And uh, if you're doing research on openness in strategy making or in other domains, I uh, deem it helpful and necessary to explicate and address the normativity inherent in such in calls for openness or in openness as a principle, together with uh, switching from looking at degrees of openness to investigating combinations of openness and closure um, that are desirable in strategy making that is labeled as open. And if you do this together, so exp explicating the inherently normative aspects of openness and uh, switch from a degree perspective to a constitutive perspective, this uh, would allow uh, us to move from um, uh, unintended exclusionary openness to more intentional inclusion through uh, legitimate closure in open processes. So that's uh, from my side. Uh, and uh, I'm now ha happy to um, yeah, discuss some of these ideas or answer, uh, try to answer any other questions which might arise.